Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to do something a bit different because I get bored very quickly. So today I'm going to do something a bit different with a special guest is Dion. Hello. So what we're going to be doing today is we're going to do a bit of kind of ask the editor. Dion is a freelance editor. We're going to talk about why you need an editor, what they do, some of the terms, some of the jargon. We're going to get into some of the nitty gritty of it and just talk about how useful editors are and how much they've helped me and many other writers. So just to begin with, Dion, to give people a little bit of a introduction to yourself, can you tell, tell us all about you? Sure. OK, well, I run a, an editing business called The Fine Toothed Comb. Uh, I've been working at it sort of freelance um, for, I guess, around about six years now, um, sort of around the edges of my day job. And then in November last year, uh, I took redundancy uh, and I've been doing it full time ever since, um, which is interesting, terrifying, fun, brilliant. Um, <laughs> we're kind of sailing that, that business ship out into the ocean and seeing where we go with it. Um, so I primarily tend to work with independent authors and small presses, um, you know, publishers, uh, and just really help the writers make their work as good as it possibly can be. Um, different writers are at different abilities, so it'll take different kinds of uh, levels of work to get them where they need to be to, uh, yeah, to get the book soaring. It's something we kind of talked on just before we start recording is that um, I've obviously, uh, I mean, I'm traditionally published, but I know many friends who are self-published and they also work with editors. We should kind of point out the fact that even if you don't, if, even if you go the traditional route and you get an agent and then you work with a publisher, you'll still work with one or more editors. You'll have uh, probably go through an edit with your commissioning editor. So this is the person who has bought the book for the publisher. Then it'll go to a copy editor, then it'll go to a proofreader. So it goes through a number of stages. So whether you're thinking of doing a self-publishing route or the traditional publishing, it's something you have to get used to. And I know that one of the traps writers fall into sometimes before they kind of send it anywhere is they want, they want to make the book perfect. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of a trap that I, I you know, I, I constantly try and talk people out of because it, it'll never be perfect. It'll just be kind of done you have to kind of leave it at some point and pass it on to someone else an yeah. editor yeah yeah i mean there's certainly a degree to which you how to put this it, it needs to be at a stage where it is good enough that people can see that it's good enough yeah. as it were at each level so i mean i for instance i will take on samples from people um and if i feel like there's you know enough work that i can help them with but not so much work that it's going to take years to you know to raise that level yeah. then that's the right kind of level if it's not yet at that level i will tend to then you know get back to the author with some hints and tips as to what they can do generally speaking to get it up to that level um but absolutely when it goes to each individual uh, editor you can only take it so far and then you're relying on and, and working with that editor to take it that next step yeah, yeah. I, I know that from, from my experience when I work on manuscripts, I know that it's ready to go to the next person or go to, or go to someone else when I feel like I've kind of reached the point where all I'm doing is moving the deck chairs around on the Titanic. It's not really changing anything. I'm changing contractions. I'm moving the odd word and I'm, I'm not actually changing the shape of the book in any way. And at that point, I know, right, I need some input from someone else to say, have you thought yeah. about this? What about that? What is this? What's this? <laughs> Plot holes. What's this? <laughs> yeah, it's funny writing. It's um, my, my wife always describes it a little bit like when you're working with clay. That when you're first doing your first, you know, doing your first and second drafts and whatnot, it feels like it's really soft and malleable. You can change it in loads of different ways. Mm -hmm. But the longer you work on it, the more time it's out there in the open air the harder it gets to actually start changing things. Things tend to sort of solidify yes. in mind. And that's a, another reason why you don't want to sort of, like you say, do too much on it before you send it to somebody else, because you may then not be open to the, the kind of changes that are needed. Yeah, definitely. And I've just thrown around a bunch of jargon a second ago. So should we talk about some of the different types of levels of editing uh, that you do and that I, I just mentioned before the different stages as it were yeah so I I tend to kind of think of the stages of editing as almost sort of um 
meshes, you know, sort of nets that, that the words are passed through. Yeah. So if you kind of think of the developmental editing or structural editing, as it's sometimes called, as sort of the biggest, widest net, and that's where you're sending it to your editor or, or your agent potentially, um, and they're giving you big scale feedback on the, the shape of the story, uh, the characters that are involved, the relationships that are there, real big picture type stuff. Um, so, you know, I might read a book and go, okay, well, this chapter is actually not really needed at all. You know, you might be talking in terms that, well, the, the way that the ending is going completely contradicts where stuff was happening in the first place. And actually there's a, a sort of stunted bit here that needs to grow out more. So yeah. the general kind of shaping. Um, your next level in is your copy editing, uh, where you are more, I suppose, finer detail, um, but you're still you're still not at your line level. You're not at your sentence level. So um, I'm having brain freeze at this moment, <laughs> <laughs> trying to come up with examples. Um, I mean, I, I guess one of the reasons I struggle slightly with differentiating the copy editing and the line editing is I tend to do both of them together. I'm right. kind of a live editor. So whereas you might get some editors where you can say, okay, can you go and do a copy edit of this? We want the sort of reasonably broad strokes. You know, we're happy with the shape of it. We're yeah. happy with how everything actually plays out. But the writing is a little bit loose. You know, there's some flabby bits here that are going to be need to be cut. Um, and, and sort of pruned and shaped more. I the, the way my brain works is I tend to see everything as I'm reading it. And I find it very difficult to kind of pull back and go, I'm only going to touch these bits and I'm going to ignore these bits, even though they're glaring errors in my eyes. <laughs> so I tend to kind of combine the two. And actually quite a lot of editors do, you know, do tend to do the both of them together. Mm. Um, so yeah, the line editing is where you're literally on your sort of word by word um, way of trying to sort of make it as, as good as it can possibly be, make the language flow, the dialogue pop, you know, getting rid of all of those errors. Your last stage, your finest, um, your finest toothed comb, as it were, that you're running through it, or your finest mesh, uh, mesh uh, is the proofread that is normally done by somebody entirely separate. Uh, and that's where you're literally getting the text ready for publication. So it's making sure that every last T is crossed, every last dot is I is dotted. Mm, my brain. Um, yeah, just literally, you know, your orphans and your widows, which are your kind of hanging bits off of paragraphs, top or bottom of the um, page where you've just got an odd word or two. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of narrowing in all the way down and as I say you would normally not expect one person to do all of that no and the reason for that is in just the same way that you as a writer will get word blind you'll stop really seeing what's in front of you mm. um, because you know what you're expecting and you've created it and there's a load of stuff in the back of your mind that you know is there but actually is it on the page well editors will start to suffer with that as well yeah having something so much so you tend to use at least a couple of editors in that process i've definitely had that before where i've had initial feedback from my editor at the publisher and they've sort of said something about a character and to me it's blatantly obvious why that character is important but there's that disconnect between what's in my head and what's on the page and when i go back and read the section they're referring to it isn't actually there because I've I've lived this world, I've lived with these characters, I've spent so much time with them, months and even years, that the bleed between what's in my head and what's on the page is, is, is quite, there's quite a big bleed. And so I think that there's not, it's everything's there for someone else to read, and of course it isn't. And that's why you need someone else to say, what's this, what's that, where's this going, what does that mean, why have you done this, and to keep, and it's also kind of sanity checking. You need someone to be constantly poking you because you want clarity. You want to be able to explain why you've done a thing. So when the reader yeah. reads it for the first time, it makes absolute sense to them. And the world feels like it's a cohesive whole rather than they feel like if they, can, if they turn left instead of right, there's nothing there. The world is just pick pieced together and it's not fully fleshed out. And I've, I've read some books like that before and I thought the world building doesn't feel 
like it hangs together sometimes yeah yeah definitely i mean i think i think one of the things that I, I try and get across to people is is that degree to which the editor is your safety net mm. it's your it's your first reader who you know rather than being somebody who's gone into the shop bought the book sat down and read it and gone i don't understand this that doesn't make sense i don't like the way that's happened yeah. and they start tearing you apart in reviews you know we're the people who can catch all of that kind of stuff challenge you when it needs to be challenged ask questions when things aren't clear like you say um and and just kind of give you that feedback so that when it does go out to print when it does go out to those shops the people who are going to read it are, are going to see the best version of it that they can where hopefully you know if all of the questions aren't answered out loud they're at least done in such a way that you can infer and understand what's going on and, and be happy with the way that that's told so when you first start working with a like a brand new client yeah. how does it work i mean have you ever had someone you know, get your initial feedback and have that kind of no it's it's obvious it's blatantly and then you kind of have to point out point out that it's not actually on the page i mean yeah, it, it's i mean the people the people for whom it's that bad tend not to be the people who i go with for clients anyway it's one of the benefits of being self-employed is you can you can look at the stuff that's coming your way and you can say well actually I don't think that one's ready or in some cases just the communication that you've had when you've started talking about the job has made you think that person's personality the way that that person is treating me even at this stage that's yeah. not necessarily something I want to work with um, I've had a couple of instances I guess where things have gone slightly awry during it um, and you know, a huge part of the editor's job is really in not just seeing what's wrong, but communicating that in a way that is collaborative and constructive. Yes. Um, to, to bring the writer along, you know, because you don't want to be in a combative state. No. You know, I, I'm here to help the author achieve the author's vision. The author is paying me good money to help them do what they want to do and if fundamentally they're either ignoring everything i'm saying or they're getting angry with everything i'm saying they're throwing their money away and we're getting angry at each other for, for nothing so i suppose I, I mean one of the one of the things i always make sure is that when i've written my comments when i've written you know the, the feedback to the authors is I always go through and reread them once I've gone through the whole manuscript. Yeah. And that's kind of just a check for, okay, if I was the person just reading this, is there a way that I could read that and, and feel like I was being slapped on the wrist? <laughs> you know, is there a way that I could take it the wrong way? And if so, I try and sort of rephrase things just so that it, it, it really demonstrates that I'm there to help. Yeah. Um, and, and that, you know, I want things to go well. And, you know, sometimes I'll throw bits of humour in. You know, sometimes I'll just highlight something and go, oh, this bit's brilliant. Because people don't want just negative. They, they want to feel like you're actually enjoying what they're writing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that's, it's really important just to kind of build that relationship, build that rapport and, and share the joy of what you're producing together. So, because, I mean, whether they're, you know, you initially um having fun with your edits or not it's the fact that it's so they're so passionate about it they spent so long working on it and that yeah. that enthusiasm for the project can be misconstrued and they can misinterpret the feedback you're giving them because they've spent so long with something i mean writing is incredibly personable like people say oh do you write for the audience i'm like, well no you write for yourself you write the kind of book you want to read yeah. So you're, you're writing to amuse and entertain yourself like if you're not enjoying it then there's something wrong uh, and so it can feel very difficult and you're sharing something that's very close to you with another with a stranger for the first time it's it's yeah. a, you know i don't say it's intimate but it kind of is in some ways and that can oh very much be difficult so. yeah i mean writing is uh, you know i'm sure people have said this before but writing is about as close as you can get to telepathy Mm. You're, you're putting what's in your brain out onto that page 
and between yourself and the editor you're trying to get that transmission as clear and as pure as possible that's it yes clarity yeah but i mean you're talking about personal stuff one of the jobs that i'm working on at the moment is for barry nugent who you interviewed not too yep. long ago yeah um, his unseen shadows universe um, he's written a YA, sorry, middle grade um, book in that called The Trail of the Cursed Cobras, and I'm working on that with him. Um, uh, and that's very personal for Barry. A, a lot of the stuff that's gone in there is part and parcel of his childhood and his family history, fictionalised, obviously, with loads of other stuff going on, but there's real Barry heart in there. And so... You know, when I first read it and was, was sort of talking with him about the feedback, I was super aware, you know, this is a guy who's who's really put his heart and soul into this and it matters to him. Mm. Um, and so when, you know, for instance, one of the things I picked up on was, was the name of the main character, which is quite a big sort of ask, really, to sort of say to somebody, you know, oh, yeah, you know, your main character. Well, I think we need to change the name and here's why. Um, so I went in with, with, you know, a few things which were big-ish and a, a lot of sort of smaller things. Um, totally conscious that this is something of, of vast import to him. But because of the way we communicated, which was on Zoom like this, yep. um, he was able to look into my face and see what I was trying to get across to him. It, we weren't purely reliant on the words. I think that's a nice, a nice thing to do is to get that sort of personal relationship. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you know, we were able to just have those kinds of conversations where you could actually talk about, well, look, here's the issue and here's the why. Um, and being respectful of each other and listening to each other. Uh, and actually, you know, when an author is really dead set on something, if there's a really personal reason for that needing to be there, well, sometimes as an editor, you've just got to kind of back up and say, well, OK, you know, that's your choice. Mm. Um, we've, you know, I've given you the reasons why I think there's an issue. But at the end of the day, it's your book to write and your book to put out. So, so long as I'm raising the issues and having those conversations with you, I'm doing my job. Yeah. But really, it's down to the author or in some cases, the publisher as well, obviously, as to what's then finally going to go into it. Mm. I think a bit of a misconception whether you're traditionally published or self-published is that you will have to work with an editor and several other editors, as we've said, because they don't always have one person doing the whole job. Yeah. And I know that some self-publishers think that the difference between the two and traditional is that you keep the clarity of vision if you self-publish versus traditional. And it's just, it's not true because either way you're working with one or more individuals who are offering you their vision of what they think you're trying to do and uh, mm -hmm. you know crystallize what they think you're striving for and it's then up to you as the individual to say yes no and and compromise or not to get it a clearer ver version i mean I, I can still do that now as a traditionally published author if my editor says oh i think you should change this and i can say no and these are the reasons why i want to keep it and then she has to say fair enough but then i have to live with the consequences of that so it, it doesn't it's not watered down where whichever path you go you still have to work with an editor and get on with them and listen to them and talk to them so out of curiosity as far as you're concerned is in in your trad publishing route because i've not i've not worked for the big publishers i work for the little publishers yeah uh, it can be very informal in sort of small publishing industry w with the larger publishing the trad publishing do you get do you get much interference from above and beyond the editors or is it literally just you and the editors and it could be almost for anybody? It's just me and the editors. So mm -hmm. uh, by just because it's the way it works, my agent always reads my books first. She gives yeah. me her feedback and then and then it goes to the editor, my publisher. Um, and I just hear from them, same like same sort of thing as, as you. They yeah. send me through quite a detailed uh, initial breakdown letter explaining stuff. And then we might have either a phone call or more recently, I guess, a Zoom call yeah. and talk it through face to face. So I can I can kind of have a day or two, read it, absorb it, calm down, write some notes. <laughs> calm down is so important. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, it is it's such a personal thing. And yeah. there, there's been a few people that I've spoken to who 
having had the the manuscripts back they need to sort of they can't stop themselves reading it straight away <laughs> can't do that no straight away yep. but then with experience they know they've got to put it away mm-hmm. they've got to allow things to filter through to feel the feelings because <laughs> it's natural you're gonna feel those feelings but to then come back to it having gone okay well this is the job this is what we've done let's have a look at it and, and tackle it rationally and yeah it's got to be hard it's, got- <laughs> it's, it's so, so what i what i tend to do is i take that couple of days three yeah. days four days calm down look at the comments again and say okay why have they said what have they said what are they actually getting to like if they yeah. say this character doesn't i don't understand this character that, that might be because I've not made it clear why this character is so important to the plot. And therefore it's up to me to put more detail in about this person and their re- relevance to the plot and why I think they're critical, perhaps farther down the line, perhaps later in the book, perhaps in another book. But And it's just that taking a step back takes practice. <laughs> it takes time to cool off. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, one thing as well that that people don't always understand is that you can have a conversation with your editor. Yes. I think sometimes people think or fear that an editor is effectively somebody with a red pen marking you and yeah. telling you <laughs> crap. Yes. And it's really not, you know, I know <laughs> I know they talk about the red pen and that lot, but I mean, for, for me, certainly, it, it's about that two-way communication. Mm. It, it's about having that conversation. And if, if I've put something that my writer's, haven't quite understood yeah. or they need to double check on I just encourage them to get back to me and we have that little bit of to and fro it was a little bit different when I was doing this as a hobby mm. because as a hobbyist I would do as many editorial parties as they wanted or needed until we were both happy that it was 100 percent um but now they have to pay me for their time <laughs> well, don't, it's your job it's your job yeah people don't tend to want to do more than one pass. Um, so what I tend to do is kind of have that Zoom conversation at the start, just to kind of set things up, do the edit, and then we have another Zoom conversation at the end. So if there is anything that they haven't understood or want to come back to me with and just double check, they've at least got the opportunity to do that. And I think it's it's a useful thing to have that bit of two way. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's. You're, you're helping them to try and make the best version of what they've created. And it's digging for the real truth and digging for the answers sometimes, because I, I think the best way is, is when my editors ask me questions, you know, why mm. have you done this? Who is this person? What what does this mean? Why is this important to you? Yeah. Like you said, you got you got Barry to change the name of one of his main characters. You know, that's that's quite a, a big thing. But there's obviously you know a reason that you did it, and it made yeah. him sit back and think about it and say, "Did I just do that because it was easy, or did because that was a name in my head, or you know?" Yeah, and it's it's funny, you know, because some things are important to some people that you wouldn't think are important, and some things aren't important that you would think are important. I mean, the, the, the first name, uh, the, the surname thing for, for Barry was actually quite an easy thing for him to change. But it was quite a big ask for me to ask, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I mean, I, like I say, I've always figured, well, look, if, they, if they don't want to hear what I'm saying, why are they paying me? You know what I mean? So I've, yes. I've, I've got They're to, not ready. I, They're not ready. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, for me, it's 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 about responding to what is there on the page. Um, you know, just being an honest responder, being kind and considerate. But if that honesty is not there, if that challenge, if that little bit of push is not there, mm. I may as well be a beta reader, you know, beta readers are fine, but you need more. You do. You do. And, the market is more competitive than ever before, whether you're, you know, going with small press or, or traditional publishing or even self-publishing. So a friend of mine, Ben Galley, self-publishes um, his all of his books through Amazon, but he works, you know, with an editor and a, and a great cover designer. And it can't be amateurish. It can't be kind of just cheap and cheerful because people expect something better now than ever before. Vanity Press still exists. I could 
yeah. write something up, send it off to a, com a company, they'll print it for me, sight unseen, and put it out. And then it's like, yeah, but it'll be rubbish. It yeah. needs to be handled by other people. Yeah. And, and I mean, I think the fact that there's so much software out there these days, there are so many ways in which you can do a professional looking job. Mm. If you're not doing a professional looking job, you, you're already falling behind quite a low hurdle. Yeah. Did those yeah. words make sense? Yeah. They make sense? <laughs> I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. You're falling behind. Yeah. Because the people are expecting, have higher expectations these days. Yeah. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about themes. Do you, so when you first get a, a book and you start working on it and, and digging into it and stuff, do you raise themes with people or, or can you see what they're going for? And um, so, so my, I'll give an example on my first book on, on Battle Mage. It's all about uh, power and this and that. And there was a side stop uh, plot about a serial killer that kind of tailed off. And it's one of those things where they said, it's really interesting. It's quite a you know, fun story, but it doesn't fit with the rest of the vision of the book that is all about power. And the, we basically ended up chopping that story, that yeah. story, took it out and take it because it made no sense. So do you get into themes when you're talking to people? Yeah, so, I mean, it, it will depend on the book. Um, there are some books where there are quite clear themes coming through it. And there are some books where it's a story. Yeah. And you necessarily, you know, there's not necessarily the theme. But what, what's quite funny is that sometimes the authors don't, don't necessarily know that the themes are there. Interesting, um, yes. So, you know, they, they've done it instinctually. They've done what they need to do to get the story across. And sometimes it just takes that second person's uh, eyesight to go, well, you know, you've got this interesting theme about, you know, consumerism here or, you know, whatever it might be. I remember having a, a conversation with Owen Michael Johnson, who's a comics writer. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you'd know him from your Geek Syndicate days or not, mm -hmm. um, but he did a, a comic series called Beast Wagon. Right. Um, which was, was brilliant. Um, and that that had uh, when I was doing sort of the review for that, I was bringing up things and asking him questions that he just hadn't considered. <laughs> but when we were talking about it, he was going, oh, my God. Yes. And I think I'm not 100 percent sure he may have been blowing smoke up my ass, but I think it actually then affected how he then went on to do sort of some of the follow up issues on it mm. because I've been able to spot stuff like that. And. I mean, that's one of the nice things as well is sort of when you do read and review things as well as doing the editing job, it's another way of kind of getting you to look at stories and think about stories in different ways. Yes. Um, you know, an, a, analysis, I suppose, fundamentally is what editing is. You know, it's analysis and feedback. Um, so reviewing is a really good way to sort of polish up those skills as well. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. No, I, I do like it. And I'm really bloody glad that I finally found a way to use my degree because for years. Right. So what was your degree then? In English literature. OK. Writing all of these essays, sort of analysing things and, and, you know, putting stuff down. And then what did I do when I left university? Well, I, I was an ice cream man <laughs> and working at a sandwich shop. Then I was working at Smith's and I was at least shelving books. <laughs> you know? And now finally I'm in the editing business and I'm actually, you know, bringing all of that kind of stuff back. And it feels bloody good. Well, my degree's <laughs> in business and computing. So, you know, uh, it's, yeah, I, I have some advantage. The weird thing is I have some advantages over other authors because I've got that business part of my brain and I've oh, worked yeah. in marketing for 20 years. So I, ask my editors and my publisher questions and they're always like why is he asking that question because the business part of my brain's going what about this what about this what about this and the creative part of my brain's doing other things but I've, I've kind of got both halves but anyway because <laughs> really? as an author I mean you know even a trad published author you've got to do a hell of a lot of marketing for yourself haven't you yes yeah it's it's ch it's definitely changed it's not the heady days of you know rent a massive space space and have uh wine and canapes and launch the book and everyone sits around <laughs> laughing and <laughs> doesn't, 
doesn't happen any, anymore. No, those days are long gone. The, the only people who are likely to rent out the Tower of London to launch their book, perhaps, are George Martin with mm. uh, a few years ago with the last but one Game of Thrones. The rest of us, happy mid-listers, uh, dream of something even fraction that exciting, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, enough about me. Uh, something else I want to talk about was, so you're talking about themes and not every book has a theme, doesn't need to. Sometimes it's just a story. Can you tell the difference or uh, people haven't told you when you're working on a book? Because some of this will come out in terms of who's made it, who's a architect who plans their books and who kind of gardens and, and builds it as they go along. Because some of that yeah. probably comes from the theme will develop, I think, in a different way. Yeah, I. it's funny. Some people just don't want to talk about it. Some people, they will just produce it and they will say, here's my thing. Other people just want to talk until the cows come home about their <laughs> writing process. Right. Uh, and that's fine. I, you know, I love, I love developing that relationship. And the more I can understand about where a writer is coming from, why they're doing certain things, yeah. the better a job I can do of helping them bring that out. Um, I, I would say you can generally tell when somebody is making things up as they go along rather than pre-planning Interesting. because you do get more of those kind of funny little cul-de-sacs of plot and character that don't really go anywhere, mm. but they're easy to spot. And sometimes they're things which genuinely help in the overall texture of the book Yeah, that they can be left in. And sometimes you just think, well, it really doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't forward the plot. It doesn't follow the uh, forward the character either. So what do we need it in there for? And, you know, again, sometimes the author goes, but I like it and I want to keep it. <laughs> um, fine, but I will let them know, you know, if there's issues on there. Um, my wife is a writer. She tends very much to just see where the story leads her. She gets a lot of pleasure out of doing that you know part of the fun for her is discovering where things go mm -hmm. um but one of my regular writers who i work with angeline trevina is a real plotter she will sit down and she will painstakingly plot loads of stuff out do all the world building stuff she'll come up with the maps and all sorts of things before she sits down but when she does sit down she can really blitz it because she knows what she's doing right from the word go um I, I don't know that there's a right way to do it. You know, some of those things that you discover, you know, like I say, with regards to theme and whatnot, they do just come out organically. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know that I would necessarily recommend one over the other. No, no, it's whatever you feel comfortable with. I mean, I, I've tried it both ways and I know it works for me. And I know that I, I can't make the stories up as I go along. Whereas I know other people like RJ Barker, he couldn't, He'll go in with like an, a core idea, like it's a, it's a it's not a spoiler because he's the first two books, right? Like I say, you know, the bone ships. He had the idea of it, right? It's but all these massive ships made from the bones of dragons, and that's part of the core idea. And the first book, it's not a spoiler because it's on the back. A new dragon has been seen and haven't been seen for a couple hundred years, right? And that's the thing in his brain. And then he starts writing. He doesn't just sit down one day and go, right, I'm going to write a book. Of about um seagulls yeah seagulls and then just starts writing there has to be something like a you know it's like a, a lighthouse in the distance that you can see and you're constantly yeah. just kind of guiding towards it but how far you veer off from one way or the other is all about individuals choice and style and approach and yeah well i mean you think of, you think of you george rr R. martin with the song of ice and fire i mean it's right there in the title of the series where it's going ultimately yeah you know got your dragons versus your ice watch my call it mm -hmm. but i mean <laughs> the amount of time that it took to get there and the amount of side journeys that it's taken yep. obviously it's not there in the book form yet but it's it's like you say good to know where you're heading at least you know if, if you don't know the very last page to actually know the final you know how it's going to come together it can help certainly mm. Are there, without giving too much of it, are there common things that you see people doing time and time again that you're constantly, you know, common traits, not necessarily mistakes, but things that people do that you're you're picking up all the time? It's different things for different writers. I mean, there are common mistakes. There are common sort of issues there. But 
I kind of don't worry about them and I tell the writers not to worry about them because yeah. they're because they're so common, because they're so easy to pick up by any editor, we can just fix them in yes. the mix. The things I think that are harder to deal with are, for instance, when people aren't any good at writing dialogue, you know, when people just don't know how to bring those characters to life or they're using a lot of passive language. So it's not really engaging the, the, the reader. Yeah. And that can be a little bit harder to deal with because, you know, fundamentally there, we, we, we're there to help them raise the quality of their books. We're not there to teach them how to write. Yes. Um, and, and unfortunately there is sort of that, that sort of overlap between people who want to write, people who can write, and people who can write and actually take it all the way through to publication as well. Um, so it's a lot of a lot of sort of delicate conversations can happen. Um, the common traits. I'm trying to think of some now. Mm. Is there anything your editors have picked up on that have sort of said, oh, Steve, you tend to do this? <laughs> um, so, so sometimes show and tell, that's a thing that comes up a lot. Um, yeah. A lot of my characters have they, they working through emotions, and sometimes I tend to do that with the character in their own head, yeah. by themselves, than with another person talking it through. And it works yeah. fine if it's a first person book because you kind of have to have more of their internal thing. But if it's yeah. fourth person, it's probably easier to see it through their actions and conversations with other people. Definitely. Definitely. You know, the amount of times that you do have people describing how somebody feels before then showing how they feel. And mm. you just think, well, get rid of that description and just show it. Um, yeah, no, that's that's a big one that's in there. Um, oh, God, I, I, I blank on these sorts of things. The moment people ask me for the detail... Yeah. I think, I mean, this is part of it, is that it is so much a responsive kind of a job. You know, every every manuscript that comes in front of us is unique. Every writer is unique. And every problem that those writers have, while there may be ones that you see going through them, it's hard to kind of pick out and just say, this is something that you as a writer should never do. Because there are so few actual rules. Yeah. In, in, it, there's the grammar stuff most of which are guidelines rather than rules. There's, the, there's not really anything that's hard and fast. Um, even with punctuation, you see people doing imaginative things with punctuation. So yeah, the other day I was reading, um, what's it called now? Iron Council by um, China Mieville. Yeah. And there's, there's M dashes being used instead of speech marks. And it's like, well, you know, so long as you're consistent, so yes. long as, so long as that consistency is in there, people will, will get things. So if stylistically you want to do things a little bit different, there's a lot you can get away with. It's just having that vision, it's knowing what you want to do, mm -hmm. and being able to actually explain why you want to do it. And I think this is where sometimes you get a little bit of conflict when authors sort of push back because there's a tendency to bluster from time to time right when, so a, a sort of a, a sense of I, I want to fight back and I'm going to say some things that roundabout almost sort of make sense but actually when you think about it when you sort of pull it apart if there's not a, a purpose behind doing something then it's there to be sort of challenged and, and picked up on and, and maybe changed and maybe not yeah. because if if some you know if you raise these things and if they don't change them and then the book comes out and a reader picks up on the same things and says well you know that doesn't make any sense or why did they do that and it's like well if you know if 10 people say the same thing you should listen and if 10 readers then come and say the same thing you're like oh, why didn't I change that so it's a two-way conversation as you say it's about communication it's um it it is. And actually, you know, I mentioned beta readers earlier, but beta readers are a really useful thing mm. to get that kind of broad spectrum of readers. Yeah. You know, to get a bunch of different views from people 
just you know initial feedback it's like amazon reviews it doesn't have to be an essay it doesn't have to be anything massive but just to get those bits of feedback from a variety of different people to 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 get a sort of an overview of how are people taking this and that that can be a really handy way just to kind of condense that story condense the narrative to something which is then going to be of an editable quality to to take to that next level yeah so have you surprised some of your authors with stuff you've told them or, or stuff you've seen in their book and they haven't realized it's even been there until they've thought about it? Yes. Um, one fellow I worked with, Kit Power, um, he had a, a book of short stories, very unique, interesting sort of construction. Mm. Um, and there were some conversations that we had on there that were really quite challenging really quite sort of pushing the boundaries but he's a guy who is all about pushing boundaries and that was actually quite a quite an invigorating um editing session really interesting guy really lovely guy um uh, and we really managed to sort of between the two of us kind of pushing together really kind of <laughs> raise, raise that but yeah yeah it's funny you know i, th I think back i mean over Christ, six years. There's a lot of people that I've worked with, a lot of books that I've worked on. Mm. But it's so strange because the moment you've finished it and you've handed it back in, it's almost like you have a memory wipe. Yes. And that goes because you can only carry so much in your head. It's true. You know? And and it's while I'm working on it, like I mean, I can I can go back and there are certain sentences that will just kind of jump out at me. It's like it's like you're holding the whole damn book in your head sometimes. Always. And I get the same thing with the um, the audio productions I do as well. I started recording audio stories for people, and I'm sort of doing the audio editing on that. And and it's this sense of you you know exactly where things lie while you're dealing with it. Yeah. You know, intonation of every word you know how everything flows and it's all just there in your head and then you finalize it and you finish it off and you send it away and you've got to clear your head because you can't possibly carry anything else in there no it's it's um, what it's the thing i've said to people is only ever work on one book at once when you're writing it because if you're working on more than one book at once you're not doing it right in my opinion because you should be focusing completely that even if you're not working on it, it's in your brain swirling around and you're building and manipulating and working on things. And so, you know, I, I, people have mentioned stuff from my first book. I have to go back and check and be like, oh yeah, that isn't that book. I can't remember. I wrote the book. It's there. I spent months working on it, years editing it. It's come out, but that's gone. I, like I can't, I can't remember it. I'd have to go back and read it myself to remind myself of some of the detail because I just can't hold it all in my brain. What about when you're working on a series then? Because my, my wife's writing book two of her little series. Mm -hmm. um, but she's also editing book one. And she's yeah. finding the editing process on book one is helping her then with where she's going with book two. Same characters, obviously, same stuff yeah. going. Um, so have you ever done that with yours or do you literally just get one book completely finished and then out before you start the next so orbit with their debut authors like i was tend to do this thing where they accelerate the publication schedule normally a book comes out and a year later you get the next book which is fine but if you're a debut author and someone's oh it's brilliant when's the next one a year and you go oh you know i'll try and remember it's a long time and there are a lot of other books that could come out and people can forget so what they do is they give me and other authors longer lead time up front and the trilogy came out in 12 calendar months. So I had September, I think March, and then the following September. Yeah, yeah. It meant that I had finished book one, edited it, handed it in. I was writing book two and then doing a bit of last tuning on, on book one. Then I'm working on book three while I was doing a bit on two, final bits on one. And that was intense, three books at the same time to some degree was intense, but they weren't all at the same stage. And because they were connected, it was easy because it was a, a, a trilogy, although I did a slightly 
uh, atypical trilogy, of course, my first one, <laughs> to make it even more complicated. It was the same world, mostly the same characters, but that was hard. I haven't done that since. Mm. Um, you tend, if it's a, if it's a ongoing world, then that's fine because I'm writing book one, thinking about two, and then you move on and you're doing, you're going back in time, and you can pull. You think in as well, yeah. I mean. If you've got the time, so Joe Abercrombie on his new series that's coming out at the moment, the, the Age of Madness, he wrote the first draft of all three. He took the time because he can to say, right, I'm going to do a first draft of all three, hand them in, and then he'll start, he started working on them. And he could, oh, that, that should go in one. And he could actually has the time to then plop, put that out, and I can pay that off better in three. And so, you know, constantly doing it. Uh, I've never done that before because I don't have the the the, you know, the ability, the lead time to take to do that. But it yeah, would be a that is, exercise. It's a bit of a luxury, I guess, isn't it? But I, it, it's kind of part and parcel of the way that storytelling is changing anyway. I mean, when you think of your TV series, you're streaming Netflix and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. How things that previously would have been done as a film are now done as effectively an epic, you know, 12, 14, 16 hour Yep. movie broken down into sort of your, your different episodes so i guess i wonder if books are going to start getting more like that i think you know? they're going to become more seasonal i think the days i mean we, we know you and i both have, have known adrian tchaikovsky and his shadows of the app 10 book series and there's the malazan which is a 10 book series and apart from one or two exceptions like your brandon sanson's i think the days of long running series are over for now it may yeah. come around again, but I think it's more going to case of more like, I don't know if you read them, the Expanse novels where... Read them, yeah. But... Okay, so it's not a spoiler to, to say this, but it's, it's a nine book series. However, each book is a story set within the same world with most of the same characters, and then it carries on. But you could read that and get a full story. And then you could do the next one, get a full story. I think like the seasonal arc of TV, I think that's where... Um, fantasy word and sci-fi will go for a little while because people want that kind of oh that was brilliant have a great taste great story put it down and then pick up the next one you'll still get the traditional trilogies and maybe four part books and stuff but I think you're right I think the way that people consume media is going to change yeah. science fiction and fantasy for sure yeah I must say I've, I've when I was younger when I had time to read <laughs> I, you know, I would blitz massive series and these days I find it hard. I find it hard to do even trilogies these days, you know, because I mean, I've got, I've got, I haven't got a to be read, to be read pile. I've got a to be read bookshelf. <laughs> In fact, I've got a, a line of three bookshelves of which the top shelf of each is the next book that I'm going to read. Your book's on there, by the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's part of my to read pile this yeah. i've got more in another room but that's my ongoing pile it's crazy so yeah i mean i i just i find it really difficult to 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 get the time to read for pleasure that i used to do yes and so I've, I've been really appreciating of late you know books of short stories anthologies of short stories novellas mm -hmm. um and, and the standalone books where i can get them um but yeah it's it's a changing world I suppose, you know, Kindle has changed things as well, hasn't it? The ability to just go straight from one book to another without having all of that big clog on the shelves as well. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The way people consume media that way. Audiobooks are incredibly popular and growing. Ebooks, they thought it would cannibalise, just like digital comics, they thought it would cannibalise the market, and it hasn't. Uh, it's just expanded it, and people will say, oh, 99p sale on a book, yeah, I'll have that. Click, and they've got it. And it will sit in their drive, forever <laughs> i've never been <laughs> well whether they read it or not the author is still happy i'm still happy like a friend of mine bought my book lately said i don't really read much of fantasy and i said i don't get paid any more money if you read it or not so i'm quite happy <laughs> <laughs> oh i love it <laughs> very very happy with that <laughs> I'll put links down below where everyone can find you and uh, all about uh, editing and uh, all the different things you do and the different levels. But uh, for, thanks for coming on tonight and talking to me about explaining just because people ask about editors, what they do, how it works at different stages and that sort of thing. 
so yeah well you know I'm, I'm always happy to answer the questions um if folks want to follow me on on the social media reach out with any sort of questions if it's your basic sort of questions about things obviously i can answer them yeah straight up if it's more detailed stuff and you need me to take a look at a sample or whatever you can get in touch with me and we can have a chat excellent well thanks for coming on tonight dion and uh, no i'll speak to you soon thank you bye everyone cheers there.